Good evening. I'm Gina Sapiro. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm delighted to welcome you here for uh, the latest of our Discoveries lectures, a series that we started a few years ago that is intended to uh, really bring Boston University's best to our larger community, including alumni, people from the Boston area, and people here on campus. Um, we're now in the fourth year of the series, and it remains a cornerstone of the philosophy of the College of Arts and Sciences to extend our learning community to reflect the breadth of a liberal arts education. And this is sponsored by, uh, largely by the College of Arts and Sciences, and it welcomes uh, members and alumni of the entire Boston University community and involves uh, all sorts of different people from different fields with, with the view that for all of us our continuing education really needs to involve keeping up with a wide variety of knowledge and perspectives from the humanities, the social sciences, and the natural sciences. So much of what we do here at Boston University is made possible by the generous alumni and parents and friends who support our alumni fund. And uh, I want to take this opportunity with my captive audience here to say that I would like to encourage everyone to participate. One of the ways that we're able to support the wonderful research of people like our speaker tonight and of our students, graduate and undergraduate, and do a whole host of things that we need to do to keep Boston University a great university and a great learning community requires really that support of our friends and our alumni. So let me just remind you that gifts of any level of support are very important for supporting our educational efforts and research. Information is available at the registration table. Uh, we welcome support of any amount and we thank those of you and there are people here, those of you who are supporters of Boston University and its various colleges, and we thank those of you who will consider being supporters of ours in the future. Now, let me turn to this evening's event and let me introduce Bill Carroll of the Department of English. Bill is a graduate of Oberlin College and Yale University, and he's been with Boston University since 1972 must have been 10 when he started. <laughs> he regularly teaches undergraduates and graduate courses in Shakespeare, English drama, and other topics on the early modern period. And in addition to his academic positions, he's also served as director of the Humanities Foundation, director of graduate studies, and we worked very closely together over the last few years when he served as chair of the English department. In 1980, he was awarded BU's highest teaching honor, the Metcalf Cup and Prize for Excellence in Teaching, and I'm sure you'll all find tonight that he has not lost his touch. Through 2005 and 6, he served as president of the Shakespeare Association of America, and currently, he's working on a project considering Shakespearean drama in the context of late Tudor and early Stuart succession debates and lineage culture. So. I welcome him here to discuss with us 400 years later, Shakespeare's The Tempest and Early America. Bill. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dean Sapiro, and thank you for inviting me here tonight. Oh, an apple, how about it? It's <laughs> good. Um, I'm gonna have to balance these my talk with, so I don't hit the computer here. It's a real pleasure to be here, and <clears throat> I hope to meet uh, many of you later. I've already run into a couple of former students, and, and uh, I'm happy to see them here. Especially, I'd like to thank Caitlin Nee for uh, arranging all of this and taking care of all the details. Before I begin, though, let me correct something in the email and publicity material about this talk. I confess that I read the draft that Caitlin sent me too quickly. It's a, it's a lesson about email. In short, I cannot talk about the manuscript of The Tempest because there is no such manuscript. Nor is there a manuscript in the sense of a handwritten original of any of Shakespeare's plays. 
And if I had, in fact, seen the manuscript of The Tempest, I wouldn't be standing here tonight <laughs> because I would be on a worldwide book tour or at least hoping to get on to Colbert. <laughs> in any event, I'm going to talk tonight about Shakespeare's late play, The Tempest, its occasion and place in Shakespeare's career, how it's been represented over the centuries, and its connection to early America. 400 years and one month ago tonight, on November 1st, 1611, Shakespeare's acting company presented at Whitehall before the King's Majesty a play called The Tempest, according to court records. November 1st is therefore the first recorded performance of The Tempest, though it's likely that it had already been performed at one of the company's profitable public theaters. The Globe, this is a reconstruction of what it might have looked like, an outdoor circular theater. This is the modern Globe in London, for those of you who haven't been there to see it. Or a smaller indoor theater with some artificial lighting, the Blackfriars. So probably November 1st was not the first performance of the, of the Tempest, but it's the first recorded performance. Let me briefly sketch out for you how a play in this period would get to the stage. First, the author or authors. The majority of plays in this period were the product of a collaboration between two or more playwrights. So Shakespeare is unusual in single authoring so many of his plays. The author would deliver a manuscript to the company that had commissioned it or had rights to it. In the early modern period in question, 1576 to 1642, there was no copyright law. And the modern concept of the author as owner of his intellectual property had not yet developed. Instead, the company owned the manuscript and protected its rights. At any given time in London, there were three or four companies putting on plays in different theaters around town. Shakespeare's company was known as the Lord Chamberlain's Men from about 1594 to 1603. And after Queen Elizabeth's death in 1603 and the accession of King James, the company was known as the King's Men. Theater companies had to have the nominal protection of a member of the nobility because otherwise actors would fall into the category of vagrants without a profession and would be subject to various unpleasant punishments. When King James entered London in his first royal procession in 1604, the members of Shakespeare's company marched in the procession wearing the king's livery, signaling that they worked for the king. After the play manuscript was delivered to the company, it would usually be copied over with theatrical annotations and more elaborate stage directions, the so-called prompt book, and actors' parts would be stripped out, copied, and distributed. Actors would never have the entire play in their hands, just their own parts with cue lines before and after. We have no record that there was any formal position known as the director, but obviously someone must have helped organize rehearsals and performances. We can see a burlesque of the practice in Midsummer Night's Dream when Peter Quince takes on these tasks and Bottom offers to play every part himself. Shakespeare's part in this process was also somewhat unique because he did not, after he joined the Chamberlain's men, write for any other theater company, whereas most dramatists were freelancers working for various companies throughout their careers. Moreover, Shakespeare became one of eight shareholders in his own company. That is, he in effect owned stock in it. Shakespeare was an actor in the company, a playwright for the company, and a part owner of the company. But Shakespeare made his money, and very good money indeed, as a shareholder by taking his share of the proceeds from every performance by the company, whether it was one of his plays or not, whether he acted in the production or not. After a play was first performed, it entered the company's repertory. All the companies performed repertory, that is, as many as four or five different plays each week, rotating a new play in once every week or two, or, or some such cycle. Some plays from the late 1580s, like Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy, were still being performed four and five decades later. This kind of cycle, though, meant that even a play as great as King Lear probably had relatively few performances during Shakespeare's lifetime. You may be surprised to learn that the record for the longest continuous run of any play in the period was, not, was set not by Shakespeare, but by his colleague Thomas Middleton, whose play A Game at Chess in 1624 ran for 
nine consecutive performances before the government shut it down because of its too openly anti-Spanish satire. Some plays would also be performed at court during holiday seasons or for other festive occasions, as in our first recorded performance of The Tempest. The company would be hired to put on plays, and the company would choose the plays or negotiate with a court official. In any event, Shakespeare's company performed at court during both Elizabeth's and James's reigns more than any other company of the time. The Tempest, in fact, was performed again at court in early 1613, one of 20 plays performed by the King's Men as part of festivities associated with the marriage of King James's daughter. The final step in the life of a play text might be its publication, usually a year or two after the first performance. Publication of the text often heralded a revival of the play in performance, but also perhaps was just another way for the company to make money. And some plays, some very great plays like Macbeth and the Tempest, weren't published until well after the author's death. The great majority of plays written and performed in the early modern period were never published. In such cases, we have only their titles, a record of performance, or an allusion to them. It's been estimated that only 10% of the plays written in this period survive as a printed text or manuscript today, not counting the Tempest manuscript, of course, which I still haven't seen. So it was around 600 out of 6,000 plays survive. Shakespeare, like his fellow playwrights Marlowe, Johnson, and Middleton, was recognized as a major playwright in his lifetime, and all but two of his known plays survive in print. By the way, if you ever run across a manuscript entitled Love's Labors One, give, give me a call, because it would be worth certainly as much as a manuscript of The Tempest. You may sometimes have heard the claim that Shakespeare's plays were never published in his lifetime, or that Shakespeare wrote his plays to be performed, not read. Well, the first assertion is demonstrably false, since 18 of his 37 or 38 plays were in fact published during his lifetime, some in multiple editions, with his name on the title page. The second claim that they were not meant to be read is also almost certainly false, because many of the texts that survive are far too long ever to have been performed, and because in some cases when we have two or more versions of the play, it's obvious that one of them was cut for a performance. And anyhow, why were so many of his plays printed if not to be bought and read? And we have records of people buying a copy of Richard II and then going to see it in the theater. The Tempest was first printed in the first folio of 1623, a collection of 36 of Shakespeare's plays assembled by his colleagues seven years after his death. Eighteen plays appeared there that had never been printed before, including The Tempest. The Tempest is the first play in the collection, probably not because it was thought of as the best play, but because it happened to be the first and best prepared in a group of four plays prepared for publication by a particular editor named Ralph Crane. And The Tempest, along with King Lear, was the first Shakespeare play printed in the Western Hemisphere in New York, 1761. It was performed repeatedly during the colonial period, although it was not the most popular play of the period. So, back after this detour to The Tempest and November 1st, 1611. Let me refresh your memories of the play with an extremely brief summary of the plot. Twelve years before the play begins, Prospero, the Duke of Milan, and his daughter Miranda had arrived on the unnamed island that is the sole location of the play. Prospero, neglecting worldly ends and his duties as Duke, had devoted himself to his books, particularly his magic books. In the resulting power vacuum, he was overthrown by his brother Antonio with the help of the King of Naples, Alonso, and barely escaped with his life, his infant daughter, and some of his books. When he arrived on the island, there were two inhabitants, neither of them, neither of them native or quite human. Ariel, an airy spirit who had been imprisoned in a tree uh, by his mistress, the witch Sycorax, but then released by Prospero, and Caliban, a savage and deformed slave, the child or whelp of Sycorax. This is from the cast list at the end of the folio text. Sycorax had died shortly after giving birth to Caliban on the island, something like 24 years before the play begins. Ariel and Caliban have become Prospero's servants, 
Caliban most unwillingly so, as we will see. The, isl the island of the play is located in the Mediterranean, somewhere between Milan and Tunis on the northern coast of Africa. Fortunately and coincidentally, as so often happens in literature, Prospero learns that a ship passing near the island carries his brother Antonio, Alonso, his son Ferdinand, and other members of the courts of Milan and Naples returning for the marriage of Alonso's daughter. Prospero therefore commanded Ariel to create a huge storm, the tempest of the tidal, in which the ship only seems to be shipwrecked. The passengers and the crew of the ship wander the island in three separate groups, reuniting only at the end. It's all part of what we learn is Prospero's plan to regain his dukedom and return to Milan. The action of the play takes place on the island in a single day between 2 and 5 p.m., which is just when the play would have been performed in real life in one of the theaters of Shakespeare's company. Prospero's plans hit a temporary snag in the play for two reasons. First, his daughter Miranda, who has seen only two men in her life, her father, and Caliban, who we are told attempted to rape her at some point in the past, Miranda sees Ferdinand, the son of the King of Naples, and falls in love with him. Tutored only by her father and by the island itself, she must learn the ways of courtship. Prospero, as any father would, warns Ferdinand not to sleep with her before they are married. The second snag is that Caliban, deeply resentful of Prospero's authority and feeling that the island belonged to him as he was there first, Caliban joins up with two of the ship's crew wandering the island and they form a ludicrous but dangerous conspiracy to overthrow Prospero and take over the island. I'll drive a nail into his head, Caliban helpfully promises. And elsewhere, Alonso, who'd helped Antonio overthrow Prospero, is nearly murdered himself by Antonio and Sebastian, Alonso's brother, who are interrupted by Ariel just in the nick of time. In short, the conspiracies and betrayals of the real world out infiltrate the island world, and the originating conspiracy that overthrew Prospero in the first place finds its repetitions on the island. To cut to the chase, Prospero more or less triumphs in the end, prevents any harm from being done, sees that his daughter and Ferdinand will marry happily, and reclaims his dukedom. He also promises to abandon his magic, the power that led him to neglect worldly ends, but also the technology that allows him to reclaim it. Quote, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. The play ends with everyone on the island about to return to Milan, with Ariel set free to the elements, but with Caliban apparently left behind with the island all his own. The most famous line in the play is probably that of Miranda in the final act. Looking for the first time at this entire motley crew of survivors, conspirators, monsters, drunks, and a few good noblemen, she naively exclaims, quote, oh wonder, how many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is. Oh brave new world that hath such people in it. To which Prospero replies dryly, tis new to thee. When Aldous Huxley titled his 1932 dystopian novel, Brave New World, he fully understood the irony of the line and took more than a few hints from Shakespeare's play, including a central character named John the Savage. Given the plot summary just offered, you no doubt immediately recognize the genre of literary work that includes The Tempest, namely the trope of the deserted island on which a traveler from another world arrives, discovers strange things, has near escapes, and then returns home. It is a subset of narratives about utopia, and its widespread in popular culture today. Most recently, there was the TV series Lost, which over six seasons worked over many of the same themes as the play, including the ambiguous nature of the island itself. Whether it was a utopian or a dystopian world was a running question. But long before Lost, and. Survivor, there was Fantasy Island, Gilligan's Island, Blue Lagoon, Tom Hanks's brilliant 2000 film, Cast Away, and many, many others. And long before these was the 1812 novel and 1960 Disney film, Swiss Family Robinson, and the much, much darker 1954 novel, and 1963, 1990, and 2008 films, 
of Lord of the Flies, among many, many others, including more recently the Bud Light commercial when one of the cool guys on a very small island pours out a stream of Bud Light to make a magic circle, which then miraculously transforms into a party scene with hot girls and rock music. <laughs> it's the same genre. <laughs> but long before these versions were Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, and long before these, long before Shakespeare's play, in fact, was the central work in this genre in England, Sir Thomas More's 1516 masterpiece, Utopia. The name, as you probably know, more imported from the Greek, and it puns on two meanings, good place, but also no place. Hence, a utopia is an idealized world that does not exist, the good place that is no place. And such is the island in the tempest, which seems to represent both an idealized and a fallen world simultaneously. Closely related to the discovered island trope are the science fiction riffs on the, on the idea. Thus Ridley Scott's chilling 1979 film Alien and its sequels follow almost exactly the same plot. A ship comes to a planet where other humans had shipwrecked, the crew seeks to discover what happened, danger threatens them, and so on. Dozens of such films have followed more or less the same path from Lost in Space and on to one film that quite openly borrowed from Shakespeare's play, the 1954 film Forbidden Planet. It's, it's quite bad if you want to look at it. Um, here the expeditionary party from Earth, which includes dashing and handsome eligible young men, discovers that the only inhabitants of the planet Altair IV are, pros are the Prospero figure, Dr. Morbius, and his daughter. Morbius's name suggests both Morpheus, the Greek god of dreams and sleep, and the infinity of the Mobius strip, as well as morbid. He is not a scientist or magician, but something apparently even more powerful, a philologist, <laughs> a master of languages, perhaps even an English major. <laughs> he and his beautiful and innocent daughter, Altera, are attended to by their, by their equivalent, by their equivalent to Ariel Robbie the robot, who Morbius has built. But there's a Caliban-like danger on the planet, a horrible monster that killed all the other voyagers years before, and now, after lying inactive for many years, has begun to attack the planetary soldiers who vie for Altera's attention and threaten Morbius's peace. After many adventures, we discover that the real villain the intelligence that directs this monster to destroy all the young men of a marriageable age is no less than the unconscious id of Dr. Morbius. In his sleep, Morbius is unconscious, unleashes the restraints of civilized behavior, and his id takes revenge on those who threaten him or his daughter. In other words, he's like any father who finds his of-age daughter tempted by handsome young men. He wants to kill them. To put it in terms of the Tempest, Prospero Morbius discovers that the Caliban monster is really within himself. And we'll return to this idea in a while. In discovered island narratives, certain themes invariably come up again and again. Civilization versus nature. Are the natives good or a threat? Will the shipwrecked hero be corrupted by new temptations or assert his civilized ethical being? Learning versus instinct, cynicism versus wonder, and so on. In making the Prospero figure a magician, scientist, interplanetary explorer, or philologist, the writer of such a narrative gives the central figure an un unusual heightened power that can be abused or used for good, or both. Yes, you say, but what's the connection to America? The Tempest is clearly set in the old world Mediterranean. European and African countries are referenced and now obscure allusions to European political issues hover behind the text. Let me then offer three ways in which America figures in the Tempest. The first is small, but points to the others. When Ariel explains to Prospero where he has hidden the king's ship, which the travelers believe was destroyed in the play's opening Tempest, he tells Prospero that it is, quote, in the deep nook where once thou calledst me up at midnight to fetch dew from the still vexed Bermudas. There she's hid. This line refers only to where Ariel once ran an errand, but invoking the Bermuda Islands and their reputation, even in 1611, as a place of storms that vexed the area, 
reveals the second way in which early America figures in the play. In July 1609, the English ship, the Sea Venture, the flagship of a relief expedition en route to the newly established but flagging English colony of Jamestown in Virginia, under the command of Admiral George Summers, this is a portrait of him after his death with the Sea Venture uh, in the background, and this is the statue of him in Bermuda today. Uh, he looks very grateful to have reached land, I'd say. Uh, so <clears throat> Summers, the sea, the, Summers was the uh, admiral in charge. The Sea Venture encountered a dangerous hurricane, a tempest which scattered the fleet, sank one ship, and drove the Sea Venture onto Bermuda's rocky shore. The ship survived, though hopelessly grounded and damaged, by throwing overboard most of its cannons and almost all personal belongings. Fortunately, all the passengers and crew survived and safely reached shore. This is the map that Summers drew of uh, Bermuda. You can see um, two figures at the bottom there, two men, and they're chasing after one of the wild boars that was on the island. And then there's a whale in the harbor. Um, you, I don't have a pointer, but you can see it there that he drew. During the next nine months, the survivors, in spite of an attempted rebellion, as in the play, constructed two entirely new smaller vessels, the Deliverance and the Patience, from the salvaged wood of the Sea Venture and from other wood found on the island. Both Ferdinand and Caliban, by the way, are also shown carrying wood in the play. And there in uh, contemporary Bermuda is a full-size replica of the, of the um, Deliverance, and it's an extremely small ship, I must say, to, to sail to Virginia in. They eventually set sail again for America, finally in arriving in Virginia the following year and incidentally saving the Jamestown colony, much to the amazement of all those who had believed the ship and its crew had been destroyed in the hurricane. Among those on board the Sea Venture was John Rolfe, who would, who would, after his first wife and child died in Virginia, marry Pocahontas, daughter of Chief Powhatan in 1614. Also on board the Sea Venture was a man named William Strachey, who wrote a work entitled A True Repertory of the Rack and the Redemption of Sir Thomas Gates, written during and immediately after the events. When he returned to England in September 1610, Gates, who was served two different terms as governor of the Jamestown settlement, brought with him Strachey's account. Although it was not formally published until 1625, Strachey's work circulated widely throughout London in manuscript, and Shakespeare read Strachey's account of the storm, shipwreck, and miraculous, miraculous salvation. At about the same time, two other works were published about the sea venture, adding a few details to Strachey's account. Sylvester Jordan's A Discovery of the Bermudas, otherwise called the Isle of Devils, and Richard Rich's The Lost Flock Triumphant, sort of a more uplift in that title. There's no direct evidence that Shakespeare read these two latter works, though he may have, but taken together, along with other references to public and private documents of the time, they demonstrate the timeliness of Shakespeare's play in 1611 about shipwreck, miraculous survival, and an enchanted island linked with the Bermudas that may or may not have devils in it. <coughs> Several other works published between 1608 and 1611 either describe the travails and suffering of the Virginia colony such as Captain John Smith's A True Relation, 1608, or trumpeted its paradisal opportunities. A Good Speed to Virginia was a sermon sending off uh, colonists, and Nova Britannia offering most excellent fruits by planting in Virginia was obviously a sales pitch. But we know Shakespeare read Strachey. He used many elements from his account, including direct verbal borrowings. Strachey's narrative is not the sole source of the play, for, uh, to be sure. The Tempest is one of two or three of Shakespeare's plays for which a clear source of the plot itself is not evident. But the voyage of the sea venture, we can say, provided the occasion of Shakespeare's play. When you, or if you go to Bermuda on vacation, by the way, be sure to visit the Maritime Museum at the western end of the main island in the fort in the old Royal Navy <coughs> dockyard. There in the shifting house, number two on this map at the bottom, which was when I saw it in 2005, a nondescript, unguarded, 
unlit building without any signage indicating what is inside, there you will find some of the actual remains of the sea venture, including a candlestick, pottery, pieces of wood from the hull, one, the one cannon that uh, reached shore, a pipe, and other memorabilia. Because there don't seem to be any guards around, you can actually touch the remains of the ship whose wreck inspired Shakespeare's The Tempest. Of course, you didn't hear me advise you to do that, <laughs> though I did. At this point, <clears throat> I really must pause for a brief comment on another disaster, this one without any hope of redemption whatsoever. I refer, of course, to the recent film Anonymous, which purports to show that Shakespeare did not write his plays, but that the Earl of Oxford did. As my former students will recall, in the Shakespeare course, I always devoted the first day to a lecture dripping in sarcasm in which I take up the so-called authorship question. Did Shakespeare, the actor from Stratford, really write the plays that bear his name? And then for the next 14 weeks, I take every possible occasion to dismantle the Oxfordian's argument. If you value actual evidence, logic, and reason, there's a simple answer. Yes, Shakespeare of Stratford wrote the plays. If, on the other hand, you prefer unproven elitist assumptions, irrational conspiracy theories, a complete lack of evidence, and a disregard for logic and probability, then, like the director of this film and a small but effective noisy band of amateurs, you will believe that the Earl of Oxford actually wrote the plays in a vast conspiracy involving hundreds of people stretching over hundreds of years for which, somewhat surprisingly, there is not a single piece of actual evidence attesting to its existence whereas there is a huge amount of evidence demonstrating that Shakespeare wrote the plays. Put it this way, anyone who actually understands how Elizabethan theater culture worked, as I tried to describe it at the beginning of this talk, could never believe in the Oxford theory. In addition to Oxford, conspiracy theorists have also claimed that either Francis Bacon, Christopher Marlowe, or even Queen Elizabeth herself had written the plays. Anyone was preferable to the country bumpkin from Stratford who had never attended Oxford or Cambridge, as Oxford, Bacon, and Marlowe had. The assumption was that only someone with such formal academic training could have written the plays, an assumption which would also disqualify Leonardo da Vinci from having invented the helicopter because he did not go to MIT. <laughs> Among the difficulties in, cl in claiming Oxford or these other figures as, as the author of the plays is the timeline, and here The Tempest is very helpful. So if you see, Shakespeare's at the top, dies in 1616. Marlowe was murdered in 1593. Or was he? <laughs> but according to the Marlovians, uh, he wasn't. He, a, a body was substituted for his, and he was spirited away to France, where he wrote all of Shakespeare's plays. He had his own career, but evidently it wasn't good enough. Um, uh, or the Earl of Oxford, who uh, died in 1604. And of course, Shakespeare writes many plays after 1604, which allude to uh, quite specific historical events. Thus, Macbeth refers to the gunpowder plot of 1605. The Tempest refers to the sea venture wreck, and so forth and so on. So not even death itself can deter the Oxfordians. Those who assert that Shakespeare did not write the plays, in my view, take their place with the flat earth believers and the Obama birthers. They are the Shakespeare birthers and don't deserve serious attention. Please do not go to that film. So back to The Tempest. Um, America, in the form of a rescue voyage to its new world colony in Virginia, provided the historical moment of the play. The third area of the play's connection to America now follows. And it is the great transatlantic tragedy of colonization and slavery throughout the new world. First. The play's plot represents a paradigm of European imperial action. The educated white European who comes to an island or nation populated only by savages or so-called lower races, civilizes it and exploits the natural resources and subjugates the natives to his own service while either converting them to Christianity or at least to what Norbert Elias has termed the civilizing process. Such words as servant, slave, and master ring throughout the tempest. Moreover, not only was the Virginia colony the destination of the sea venture and news of all of England's colonial projects in the New World much in the news in the years just before The Tempest was written, but Shakespeare had at the same time 
also been reading another text about the old world's encounter with the new world's mysterious natives and astonishing natural wonders. In Act Two, Scene One, the courtier Gonzalo, virtually the only morally good court figure, offers a vision of the ideal commonwealth that is in several places a word-by-word -word quotation from an essay by the great French writer Michel de Montaigne, whose works were translated into English in 1603. This essay, entitled Of the Cannibals, challenges the standard way of conceiving of the savages of the New World in opposition to the so-called civilized peoples of Europe. Montaigne laments the ways in which Europeans have failed to see their own shortcomings. To his, and no doubt to his readers' surprise, the indigenous natives of Brazil, even if they are cannibals, are described as more civilized than the European explorers who encounter them. According to Montaigne, and this is the section taken up in Gonzalo's speech, theirs is a nation, quote, that hath no name of magistrate nor pol politic superiority, no use of service, of riches, or of poverty, no contracts, etc. It was, in short, a utopian society, one ethically superior to the one that sought to colonize it. The plot of The Tempest suggests how Shakespeare may have learned this from Montaigne, as the court party, except for Gonzalo, is fallen and corrupt from civilization, and Prospero is a very, very hard master on the island. His chief subject, Caliban, is, as we saw, savage and deformed, and Caliban's name further is an anagram of cannibal, the key word in Montaigne's essay. And so the European encounter with the New World, in many respects, shadows the action and characters of the Tempest. As we frequently find in Shakespeare, the play is a palimpsest, layering different worlds, old and new, and different time periods, one upon the other. The play also contains substantial allusions to Virgil's Aeneid, Ovid's Metamorphoses, and other works in the classical tradition, but unfortunately I don't have time to discuss them tonight. Among the characters in the play, Prospero is clearly a central figure, magician, politician, father, duke, lord of the island, and a creator of illusions. As such, he's frequently been seen as a stand-in for Shakespeare himself. Prospero's farewell to what he calls his art, his magic, has often been taken as Shakespeare's farewell to the stage, as The Tempest is sometimes described as Shakespeare's last play. But it wasn't his last play. He would remain in London another two years and co-write three more plays before retiring to Stratford in 1613. And there are so many negative aspects to Prospero's character that his absolute identification with the playwright seems unlikely. For me, the most interesting, controversial, and talked about character in the play is Caliban, partly because he's the link to the post-colonial American reading of the play. How should Caliban be represented? What did he look like? Was he represented as a savage of the New World, an Indian? Is he in fact human? His character seems key to the play's deepest question, what does it mean to be human? Early modern writers and artists imagined the New World in a variety of ways. Here is Jan van der Straat's famous allegorical figure of America, who is a woman newly awakened and vulnerable, dressed only in a feather skirt and cap, seated on a hammock, Beside her is a wooden club like those used by the Tupanamba Indians of Brazil. The surrounding landscape is full of exotic animals, an anteater, a taper, and a sloth, and in the background is a group of cannibals. Standing before America, fully clothed, is a European man, Amerigo Vespucci. This illustration reflected the beliefs of many Europeans that America was a glorious virgin land waiting to be exploited. Sir Walter Raleigh, <clears throat> in his discovery of the empire of Guiana, described that land uh, in this way. Guiana, he said, is a country that hath yet her maidenhead, never sacked, turned, nor wrought, the face of the earth hath not been torn. This image of America, by which was meant, by the way, not only what is the US, but uh, North, uh, 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 North America, parts of North America, Central America, and northern South America generally, from the Virginia colony down to the gold mines of Peru. This idea of America was of a virgin paradise, paradoxically both passive and inviting of conquest, and at the same time dangerous and full of savages. 
When Trinculo finds Caliban hiding under a cloak in act two of the play, he wonders, what have we here, a man or a fish? And says, were I in England now and had but this fish painted, not a holiday fool there, but would give a piece of silver to see him. There would this monster make a man, any strange beast there makes a man. When they will not give a doit, a farthing, to relieve a lame beggar, they will lay out ten to see a dead Indian." Unquote. How were Indians seen or represented in early modern London? Many texts with images were published at the time, and Shakespeare must have been familiar with some of them, and he had very likely seen, perhaps even spoken to, although there's no evidence, one or more of the 25 or more American natives who lived for a period in England and were, as Trinculo's line suggests, a public spectacle. The native peoples in London included Eskimos brought back from voyages by Martin Frobisher, John Smith in his General History of Virginia, 1624, depicted Indians in scenes that he himself uh, witnessed. The most famous images today remain those of John White's paintings uh, on, a tr on a voyage to Virginia in 1589, which showed natives encountered on Roanoke Island. Here are some of the paintings. Just have a look at these. There's only one copy, there's only one set of these paintings in the British Library. These paintings were later engraved by Theodore de, Theodore de Brie and printed in the second edition of Thomas Harriet's Brief and Tube Report of the Newfoundland of Virginia and were very, very widely circulated and imitated. Still, Caliban doesn't seem to be represented simply as an Indian in the play, though Trinculo associates him with the spectacle of a dead Indian in England. In Caliban, Shakespeare may also have been thinking of the long European tradition of the so-called wild man, and had surely seen many texts which purported to show various kinds of monstrous men. So here from the 16th century, the standard, the, 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 the beard, the hairy body, the club that he's carrying. Here uh, from Holbein the Younger in the 16th century, the same idea. Here from a ballad of 1628, a wild man. And here from a later text, uh, images of, of, of so-called monstrous men. And indeed, the word monster, not Indian, is in fact most often associated with Caliban. 18th century painters usually depicted Caliban as monstrous, as in the first known painting of the play by major artist William Hogarth, 1736. Hogarth clearly alludes to other paintings of the Annunciation. Here, innocent Miranda feeding a lamb wears the blue color of and assumes the posture of the Virgin Mary, uh, the, the posture that's typical of the Virgin Mary and other Renaissance paintings. Ferdinand is like one of the Magi paying homage, but Caliban on the right, here is a detail of him, is a malevolent plebeian menacing uh, figure. His webbed foot, right foot crushes two linked doves, Venus's doves, symbol of the marriage that Caliban threatens. And here, in Henry Fuseli's 1789 painting, Caliban is a sinister, lustful figure of rebellion opposed to the Enlightenment reason, a Prospero whose outstretched arm and pointed finger symbolizes his power, and again, a seraphic, virginal uh, Miranda on the left. While in this 19th century German uh, illustration, the illustrator has taken Prospero's command to Caliban, come thou tortoise, quite literally, for Caliban is a completely alien amphibian or giant tortoise, human only in his upright stature and genitalia, and threatening in his monstrosity. He's saying there in German, oh, oh, oh would it had been so, that he had in fact completed the rape of Miranda. This drawing makes obvious uh, what Caliban, how Caliban is also threatening in terms of sexuality uh, in the play. He's said to have attempted to rape Miranda, and by contrast, uh, the civilized Ferdinand restrains his desire for Miranda until uh, he will marry Miranda, uh, restrains his desire until he will marry uh, Miranda. David Scott's 1837 painting shows a Godzilla-like amphibian contrasted by the angelic Ariel floating over him. 
And John Hamilton Mortimer's 1820 engraving shows what he called a puppy-headed Caliban. This image can serve to represent a turning point in representations of Caliban in the 19th century, during which Caliban slowly became a more sympathetic figure. Beneath the Mortimer engraving, for example, is the line, do not torment me. Ca representations of Caliban in the, on the late 19th century and early 20th century stage frequently continued this idea of Caliban as monstrous, yet also increasingly a more or less sympathetic figure of suffering. For some romantic writers of the 19th century, Caliban became, as Coleridge wrote, quote, in some respects, a noble being, a man in the sense of the imagination. All the images he uses are drawn from nature and are highly poetical. For William Hazlitt, Caliban's, quote, deformity, whether of body or, net or mind, is redeemed by the power and truth of the imagination displayed in it. It's a little hard to imagine when you see you know, some of these figures. Such writers were thinking particularly of Caliban's lines about the beauty of the island. The isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears and sometime voices that if I then had waked after long sleep will make me sleep again. And then in dreaming the clouds methought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me that when I waked I cried to dream again. The romantic imagination also associated Caliban with a strong resistance to tyranny, a theme which we will shortly see again. Later in the 19th century, however, a new kind of Caliban began to appear on the stage, derived in part from the popularization of the writings of Charles Darwin. Sir Frank Benson, fa he's holding a fish there as well, famously entered the stage with a dead fish in his mouth he climbed a tree, hung upside down, and otherwise imitated the monkeys and baboons he had studied. Benson described Caliban as the missing link, while Herbert Beerbaum Tree's deformed savage continued what became a frequent Darwinian theme in representations. Alec Clunas in 1957 was both ape and, as his webbed arms suggested, an amphibian. And after all, uh, Caliban is mo most often called a fish. For the Shakespeare tercentenary in 1916, Percy McKay's gargantuan production, which required 30 professional actors and 2,500 mute participants in its pantomimes, made Caliban, as missing link, the center of the play, taking him through 10 historical scenes from other Shakespeare plays from ancient Egypt through the rise of Western civilization in Roman Greece, as he finally learned to control his passions and seek rational enlightenment. The 1979 BBC film of the play continued the Darwinian missing link conception in this hairy but mostly human Caliban. A Globe Theater production in 2000 depicted Caliban as a fishy monster covered in mud, seaweed, and shells. As in Benson's production, he entered bearing a live fish which he threw to the groundlings between bites. I'm not, I'm not sure about that one. Other modern versions of Caliban, though, have taken quite different directions from the, from the Darwinian line, however. One track is Caliban as skinhead and threatening, but otherwise human in shape, as in Derek Jarman's 1979 film, uh, in which, uh, in which uh, Caliban is about to eat a raw egg and there's fire to suggest how dangerous he is in the background. Or in this Royal Shakespeare production, 1993, or in this uh, suspiciously similar Shakespeare and Company production of 2001. I, I wasn't even sure that it wasn't the same production for a while. Peter Greenaway, in his remarkable and perverse film, Prospero's Books, has the entire play take place in Prospero's mind as he writes the play himself. John Gielgud, as Prospero, speaks virtually all the lines in the play, as the entire play is his script. The film is organized around what Greenaway speculates were the 24 books Prospero brought to the island. Book of wind, book of water, pornography, you know, everything that you need on an island. Caliban is, of course, still present, another nasty skinhead rebelling against authority. In these productions, directors bring Caliban and Prospero closer together on the human scale 
but they frequently introduce a, net, a new category that sharply distinguishes, distinguishes them as well, social class. These Calibans have the look, accents, and attitudes of the proletariat. If the images we have just seen depict Caliban primarily as savage and deformed, as the cast list describes him, other artists and directors have, since the 19th century especially, also thought of Caliban as the third of those terms, slave, in racial terms, not a red-skinned Indian, but a black-skinned slave. Nowhere more disturbingly so than in John Tenniel's 1863 illustration for the magazine Punch, in which Caliban is Sambo, being handed the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln, who encourages Caliban Sambo to beat the Confederate soldier on the left. The line at the bottom, I'm not sure you can see it, is said to be a inward translation of one of Caliban's lines in the play. The British sympathy for the Confederate cause turned Caliban into the most hateful of stereotypes. Recent productions of the play, however, have given us black Calibans that are far more sympathetic. Jonathan Miller's landmark production in 1970, which I happened to see, um, I was virtually speechless at the time, I could hardly move, but uh, I happened to see it, cast a very dark black African actor as Caliban and a light-skinned black actor as a mulatto Ariel. Distinguished both by skin color and social class, both were nevertheless subject to a, to a harsh white colonial master in Prospero. A Royal Shakespeare production gave us a Rastafarian Caliban in 1982, and a 2006 RSC production with Pat Patrick Stewart as a harsh Prospero set in the Arctic, don't ask me why, uh, depicted Caliban as an Inuit, bound and helpless before Prospero. While in the 2009 RSC production at the Baxter Theater in South Africa, Caliban was played by the great South African actor John Connie as a kind of Nelson Mandela figure, and Prospero as a harsh apartheid master by the also great South African actor Anthony Scherr. A 2010 production at Stratford, Ontario offered a stunning image of Caliban as a blend of African warrior and semi-monster. So my favorite images. Most, I wish I'd seen that production. Most recently, Julie Taymor's 2010 film depicted Caliban as distinctly African, his skin caked with mud like the earth, his face half black but also half white with a blue eye for the white half. Taymor had previously staged the play in New York in 1986 and that Caliban wore a ceramic stone mask, like the mud people of New Guinea, in her thinking, which symbolized his imprisonment. During his rebellion against Prospero, Cal Caliban took one of the logs he was supposed to be bringing in, smashed it against his head, and freed himself. In making Caliban a sympathetic man, direct black man, directors almost inevitably have to make Prospero less sympathetic and more implicated in the black man's subjugation. So Prospero, as Prospero frequently, uh, repeatedly denounces Caliban as a slave, a thing most brutish, a member of a, quote, vile race. The result can be an emotionally, the result of this sympathetic black uh, figure and the harsh uh, colonialist uh, white Prospero can sometimes be an emotionally and intellectually unbalanced version of the play at least in terms of what I think Shakespeare's original, original audience might have thought, but I do think much of it is, in the, is, is, is right. Julie Taymor's is the most recent film version of the play, released last year, though hardly shown in theaters before it went to DVD. And it's brilliant and also frustrating in all the ways that Julie Taymor can be. Her most, most notorious innovation in the film is to cast Helen Mirren as a female Prospera, the Duchess of Milan, whose husband had died and left his throne to her. But Taymor's gender reversal for Prospero is by no means the first. There are many, many over the, over the years. Uh, for example, at the Globe Theater in 2000, Prospero was played by Vanessa Redgrave. There are problems with this gender reversal, particularly with the play's themes of paternity and authority, but it can work well, as it mostly does, and as you will see in a moment, in Taymor's film. <coughs> In the course of the play, Prospero learns many things about himself 
and the world that even his magic powers had never encompassed. Among them, self-control, unlike Dr. Morbius in For Forbidden Planet, and forgiveness. That is, Ariel is always linked in the play with air and fire, while Caliban is linked with the heavier of the four elements, earth and water. Between them, Ariel and Caliban would make up a completely balanced human soul. Ariel is therefore linked with Prospero's higher powers in the play and Caliban with his lower animalistic human desires. Or as Forbidden Planet has it, Caliban is the id to Ariel's superego. For me, the most powerful moment in the play occurs in the final scene when Prospero has all his enemies at his mercy, helplessly confined. When Caliban enters the scene defeated, Prospero still calls him a demi-devil, but he also admits, quote, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine, unquote. Ariel reminds Prospero of his humanity and of his best potential, that is, his non-Caliban side. And Prospero offers the following speech, in which, in my reading of the play, he in effect renounces the Caliban within his own soul. And I'll show you this clip now from the Tamor film. I suspect most people haven't been able to see it. If you're going to have anyone besides John Gilgood be Prospero, I think um, <laughs> Helen Mirren does the job. And you notice how, what a crucial long pause and how wonderful it is <clears throat> after she summons up all of her magical powers, and you actually see the noontide sun, which has been dimmed, um, the eclipse uh, go, the long pause before she says the key, the key turn in her, in his Prospero's life is, but this rough magic I hear abjure. So it's a wonderful clip. I hope you should get to, to see this whole film. Well, we've covered a long journey tonight, uh, though I hope we haven't run, run aground. Um, and may look for a miraculous uh, salvation here in a moment. We've seen Caliban, <clears throat> for one, transformed over the centuries from a monstrous amphibian to a heroic victim of oppression. Um, I'm not sure which of those is right, uh, but those are reflections of the times we live in and the times um, in the 19th century when he was first represented. I focused on just a few strands of this fantastic, provocative play and its connections to the new world, but we could be here for hours more trying to grasp the full imaginative power of the play. But, like Prospero, it's time to know when to retire and to say, for tonight at least, that our revels now are ended. Thank you very much. <laughs>
I mean the later Calibans, I'm sorry. Later Calibans. Yeah. yeah. Similar to Gollum. Okay. It's interesting. Good, thank you. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much, Bill, for that great talk. Um, I, I, had, I had a question actually about um, Tamor's representation of uh, of Sycorax and, and how that worked, especially when you when you turn Prospero into woman. Um, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about that or about Sycorax in general, and as that resonates with that scene that we saw. Well, that uh, um, this is a PhD student who's writing on this play, so uh, <laughs> watch out. Um, <laughs> And I didn't mention one of the things that he thinks is really important, but, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> it's another Montaigne essay, which we know we now know, thanks to Amos, that uh, Shakespeare read. Um, well, Tamor doesn't uh, show Sycorax, but Sycorax I've always thought of, always seen as sort of the, the female dark parallel or inversion to Prospero. Sycorax was a magician. Uh, a sorceress who was banished from Algiers to the island 24 years before the play began. She had a son, Caliban. Prospero was a magician banished to the island 12 years before the play begins. He has a daughter, Miranda. And so they're like gender and uh, gender reversed in various ways. And um, I think Amos has floated a softball up here for me because in that speech of, of um, uh, uh, Prospero's that uh, that Helen Mirren was speaking when she is listing all of the um, powers that she has to dim the noontide sun and everything she's going to give up. She's actually uh, quoting almost word for word from a, both Latin and an English translation of a speech in Ovid's Metamorphoses by that's spoken by Medea, a female witch. And so, in a way, what he's doing, what Prospero, what Shakespeare's doing there, is making Prospero ventriloquize the demonic possibilities uh, that are associated with the, negatively, with the female witch, and rejecting them, and going back, instead of continuing with magic, breaking his staff and burying his book, throwing it, and so on. So, uh, he does, so uh, Tamor doesn't actually show uh, Sycorax, but if you want to see a Sycorax, it's in uh, Derek Jarman's film, which is uh, a very homoerotic uh, kind of film, and it actually shows a, it's just, disgusting scene of a gigantically grotesque um, Sycorax uh, nursing Caliban in that. Uh, so I, you know, don't see it too late at night. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a good scene. But mostly Sycorax is just there verbally as the demonized female other who just never appears, but is sort of always potentially there. Well, thanks for the question. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? Dean Sapiro? Any other questions? Well, I have, I would like to add one more thing. I was hoping someone would ask me about the Oxford theory, because I have one more thing I'd like to say about it. <laughs> because, uh, because it's not enough that <clears throat> they have to trash Shakespeare and suggest that Oxford wrote the plays. He was actually a terrible man. Um, but um, what they never quite give you is the full lunacy of the entire theory about Oxford and who he was. And if you don't go see this film, but if you saw the film, you'd get the full-blown theory. And I want to read you the bullet points of the argument as it appears in the advertisement for a book by Paul Streitz, which is the basis for uh, one of the bases for this film. So Queen Elizabeth, you may know, was known as the Virgin Queen, uh, but not in this theory. She had something like six illegitimate children. One of them was by her stepfather, Thomas Seymour. Two, the child was secretly placed in a nobleman's home and raised as Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford. So Oxford is actually Queen Elizabeth's illegitimate son. Um, Robert Dudley, later the Queen's consort, conspired with the king and murdered Dudley's wife, Amy Robesart, so that he could then uh, Oxford could marry Anne Cecil, daughter of the Lord Treasurer, and so forth. There are lots of things like that. But then Queen Elizabeth sleeps with the Earl of Oxford. She has incest with her own son, sleeps with Oxford, and produces a child who turns out to be the Earl of Southampton, who was Shakespeare's patron. So this is how we get you know, one of these connections. She also gave birth to, apparently, the Earl of Essex. And uh, last, and this is my favorite part, a, a, 
confronted with the timeline problems, uh, the Oxfordian Strites argues, that Oxford did not die in 1604, as, 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 as of course he couldn't have written the plays, but he was exiled to the Isle of Mersea near Colchester. There he wrote The Tempest, Shakespeare's sonnets, and the King James Version of the Bible. So <laughs> just in case you're wondering, um, he's responsible for almost everything of worth in the period. So that was my, but I was hoping someone, I could just you know, bring that in. <laughs> well, with that, it seems appropriate to end it because, because it seems that I'm really Shakespeare because I've spent a lot of time in Colchester and used to take my son to Mercy and play there with buckets and shovels. Well, you must have, you may have touched something that actually... Or I'm happen. Queen Elizabeth. In any case, I'd like to <laughs> thank you, Bill Carroll. Yeah. Um, and as you can see, he still hasn't lost his powers of the Metcalf Prize and Cup from uh, earlier time. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight. Uh, let me say that we look forward to seeing you, I hope, at the next Discoveries Lecture, which will be Thursday, February 9th, and that will feature faculty from the Departments of Political Science and History who will discuss gerrymandering in Massachusetts. Um, it is an anniversary also of, I think, Elbridge Gerry's birth. Um, but also we'll see whether we can have a secret appearance by Barney Frank, who may <laughs> have something to say about gerrymandering in Massachusetts. In any case, we will look at this historically and in contemporary periods, so we hope to see you uh, then as well as in future alumni programs. Um, please join us out there now for a light reception, and um, I'm sure that Bill will be there for you to be able to ask more questions. So thanks very much, and please join us. Thank you.